Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the fourth and final day of the 31st Virginia Film Festival. Thank you so much for joining us all this weekend. Uh, we're all still we're all still upright. We're all still moving. Hope you guys are still uh, feeling uh, enough energy for a still very full day of films we still have going on uh, all through this evening. So thank you so much. This. Uh, Orson Welles' program this year has been a lot of fun for me. Um, as programmer of the festival, it, it has given me a lot of uh, fun tools and toys to play with this year. Um, on Thursday, we started things off with the eyes of Orson Welles. On Friday, I sat down with Alan Hughes for a discussion of F for Fake, um, which, if you're familiar with that film, it'll, that'll be a really good primer for what we'll be seeing uh, today. And, Perhaps yesterday you caught the documentary film They'll Love Me When I'm Dead, which uh, specifically focuses on the decades-long process of pulling uh, the other side of the wind into reality. Um, I'm not going to speak too much programmatically about it. That's why we have our special guest here to uh, both provide some context at the top and to moderate the discussion with Peter Bogdanovich via Skype to follow the screening, so please Please stay in your seats and stick around after the credits roll. Um, but I just, again, want to say thank you so much to all of you. Uh, this film is eligible for the Audience Favorite Award, so hold on to those ballots and weigh in as you like. Turn those phones off. Both noise and light are distracting to our neighbors, so be a good neighbor there in the aisles and the seats. And with that, I simply want to ask you to help me welcome Turner Classic Movies host Ben Mankiewicz. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, appreciate it. Thanks to, uh, again, to the Virginia Film Festival for inviting me back. It's a beautiful town. It's a beautiful festival, and I'm really honored to be here. It's, uh, it's great. Um, so, uh, this is going to be an experience uh, for, <laughs> I suspect, uh, for all of you. Uh, it was for me when I saw it uh, uh, the first time at uh, the Telluride Film Festival in, uh, in September. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background uh, about the movie and, and, and a tiny bit of context before you see it will save time for the conversation after the movie with Peter Bogdanovich, uh, who along with uh, Frank Marshall uh, and a number of other film lovers around the world, uh, editor Bob Morosky, who, who, uh, who spent years uh, bringing this film that hadn't had a frame shot since 1976 uh, uh, to the screen. So um, it was uh, shot in Spain and the desert in Arizona, and the MGM uh, old back lot in uh, Culver City, and uh, Peter Bogdanovich's house uh, over the course of six years. Um, there was never enough money for Orson Welles to finish this film. Uh, he would go off and he'd shoot a commercial or a movie. Uh, John Huston, who plays the, the director in the film, a character that is very clearly based on Wells, that Wells said was not based on Wells, but <laughs> come on. Um, he, uh, uh, right, and then there's a, a, a character of the director who uh, worships uh, Wells, is, is played uh, by Peter Bogdanovich. It appears to be based on Peter Bogdanovich, although again, Wells said that, 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 just, a, that just a stroke of luck, it's, it really wasn't. By the way, I'm going out of order here, but that uh, character, the Bogdanovich character, uh, Peter was going to play another role in the movie. He'll tell you about it afterwards. But uh, Rich Little uh, was cast to play the role that you will see Peter Bogdanovich play because he was a, he was a director who did voices. And initially they cast Rich Little. He said he could, uh, he said he had uh, three weeks to shoot the movie. <laughs> it took uh, six and a half years, so Rich's time ran out. Um, Ultimately, it's a little unclear why he left, but he was replaced by uh, Peter, who left the other role and came up and took on the role of Peter Bogdanovich. Um, <laughs> so, uh, one of the reasons why the fine there are a lot of reasons why the financing got held up, and then it was held up in, in, in litigation uh, between uh, Wells' daughter and, uh, and, and the woman who he spent most of his life with. Um, but a big reason why it was both held up and the financing ran out was that it was, was co-financed by the brother-in-law of the Shah of Iran, 
and then in 1979, you, you probably know, the Shah was deposed and some other people took over in Iran. And uh, so this movie was really uh, held hostage by the uh, government of the uh, Ayatollah Khomeini. And it was locked up in a, as Iranian property in a vault in Paris. No movie has a history quite like The Other Side of the Wind. Um, it is the story of, uh, of a great director who has uh, uh, fallen out of favor with the collapse of the studio system and living in sort of self-imposed exile in Europe, and he returns to make one final great film, the movie inside this movie, also called The Other Side of the Wind. <laughs> but it's not Wells. <laughs> um, uh, uh, that's, the, that's the John Huston uh, character, uh, and so while he comes back and he's trying to get financing for a movie that doesn't have financing, again, it's not Wells, um, uh, uh, he has celebrated his 70th birthday party. That's sort of the structure of the movie, and he's there hangers on all around him from the new Hollywood, because Wells did hope that he could return in this wonderful era of creativity in Hollywood, 1967 to 1976, and that he would be embraced in a way that he had never been, and that therefore he could make a creative movie like this in that era at a time when directors like Peter Bogdanovich and Hal Ashby were thriving. But uh, alas, for whatever the reasons, Wells never quite got that. Um, I will. Uh, I want to leave you. I mentioned these quotes uh, yesterday when I introduced uh, uh, "They'll Love Me When I'm Dead," which is what Peter says Wells said to him, but even Peter now <laughs> admits that maybe he didn't say it directly, but uh, it's a great story. Um, so Frank Marshall, who was the production manager on the other side of the wind, is now you know one of the most powerful uh, producers in, in Hollywood, has been for, for decades, also a director. Uh, he has this line in the documentary, they'll love me when I'm dead. Uh, Orson came to me and said, Citizen Kane is the greatest curse on my life. Every time I do anything, people start comparing this to where it stands vis-a-vis -vis what they call the greatest American movie. This, said Wells, is my curse. And then Marshall points out, no other director has ever been held to such an impossible standard. There is also a, a line from Wells in that documentary. Most of the shot is covered, but it's clearly from a talk show that he appeared on, and it appears to me to be after 1970, so while he was making this movie. It's, it's unclear to me exactly when or what talk show. But Wells said this, I fear dying, and that quote that I just gave you, and this one, I think is a good place to leave your frame of mind as you watch what Wells wanted uh, out of this picture, and what he thought about his own legacy in Hollywood, and his own legacy in his own mind. Wells said, I fear dying before I have accomplished something. Let me start it over because I want to say it better. I fear dying before I have accomplished something that I'm not ashamed of, that I'm even a little proud of. I'm afraid that I will be taken away before I have justified the luck and joy that I've had. So that's Orson Welles. He doesn't want to die before he completes something that he's not ashamed of in easily the late 60s and probably the early 70s. A director who made uh, Chimes of Midnight and Touch of Evil, The Trial and Othello, Macbeth, The Lady from Shanghai, and of course The Magnificent Ambersons and Citizen Kane. Constantly looking for an affirmation that has really eluded him in his entire life, or at least at a time when he could appreciate it, um, I think really until now, when Hollywood is finally, appropriately, at long last, uh, embracing Orson Welles as as they probably always should have done. So with that in mind, enjoy The Other Side of the Wind, and after the movie, conversation with, uh, with Peter Bogdanovich, who you certainly want to stick around for. Thanks very much.